My name is Jean Alton, and I'm from Alzheimer's San Diego, and very pleased today to uh, introduce you to our guest presenter, Ms. Kimberly McGee. And Ms. McGee has been working with Alzheimer's San Diego for some time, as well as other organizations too. And let me tell you just a little bit about her so um, we can appreciate all of her expertise, but also that she is giving us her time here today, which is a tremendous gift to Alzheimer's San Diego and to all of you folks, the families that we serve. So Ms. McGee is an elder law attorney and she is a certified elder law attorney. And this is a, a niche specialty within the area of law. She is with Black and McGee, which is a professional law corporation, and she does focus her practice on advocating and protecting clients' best interests. She has a broad range of experience in the areas that we'll be talking about today, which is estate planning, elder law, long-term care planning, <clears throat> asset protection, retirement planning, and many other areas. And so she uses that knowledge and expertise and passion to provide clients with the plans of caring for themselves or loved ones that they need for asset prevention, pre pardon me, preservation, and in, for sure to be ensuring that um, clients' wishes are respected. That was me that did the little skip ahead there. <laughs> She's the member of so many organizations uh, that I can't even list them all, but many of them are focused on her area, which is as an attorney and focused on the area of law. She's also very involved, though, in many health organizations and social service organizations around San Diego and, um, you know, does some volunteer work for some other nonprofit organizations as well. So a busy lady, to be sure. She takes a very active role in the dementia and elder care community. And we're very grateful for the support she gives to us at Alzheimer's San Diego. I wanna just tell you that her certifications do include um, estate planning, trust and probate law. And this is through State of California Board of Legal Spe Specialization. And again, she's a certified elder law attorney and that she's one of only, I believe, a couple here in San Diego County. So this is, you know, really the type of person you folks want to be talking to with regards to the issues that you have on your mind and why we're here today. Uh, Ms. McGee is also a VA accredited attorney. So many of our families we work with are uh, veterans or spouses of veterans, and Ms. McGee has expertise in this area as well, too. So there she is. Whew. <laughs> Lot there. And um, we're very grateful to have you. So let me see if I can do this. There she is. And the CELA is the Certified Elder Law Attorney designation. And so here's our agenda for today. We, I say we, Ms. McGee will be talking about advanced care planning basics. She'll be talking about what the key legal documents are involved in that. Then she'll be switching gears to talk about strategies for financing long-term care. And this is something that many of us worry about because we know that the cost of long-term care is expensive. And for many of us, if not most of us, and then we'll be addressing next steps and additional resources. I do want to thank everybody for being here specifically because what we're going to talk about is really hard and nobody wants to. And I get that. And what you're all going through is is very hard. And, you know, like I need one more thing to do. Right. Like I need one more. But what you're going to be doing is taking some control. And I always like to explain to people that the more knowledge you have in this area, the better equipped you are to handle it, because there is nothing easy about a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia. It's important to remember that people, oh, like they wish they had another disease, something else, because it would be easier to deal with and to talk about it. Alzheimer's and dementia and other major neurocognitive disorders are very isolating. And so 
I'm glad you're all here. You know, hopefully one day we'll get back to these in-person meetings and I'm going to do my best. I, you know, I always hate talking at a screen. I always like to have an audience to know what's happening. So I do want to encourage while I'm, we're, while I'm talking through this, please ask questions, right? We're going to have a question and answer section. If you have a question, put it down so it doesn't get lost or you can hold it to the question. And, we're going to have two question and answer sessions, but it's important that we kind of talk about it because if you have a question, I'm sure somebody else does too. So let's start with the advanced care planning basics. And the reason why we care about this is the more you plan in advance, the bigger your options are, right? I always say like your box is really big if you start early. And because if you don't, then in the crisis, your box is really little. So deciding how to create a plan in advance it's going to help you stay in control. It's going to help your loved ones stay in control. It's going to help the person making decisions for you not carry guilt, right? And that's one of the things I get to see on the backside of this disease is after people have passed, the loved ones are left carrying guilt that they didn't know if they did it right. So if you can plan in advance, you can make decisions about the care you want when you can't speak for yourself. And then it ensures that your future decisions are based on your personal values and preferences. I one time had a client who nominated her sister as a person to make decisions for her, but her sister had a religious belief that conflicted with her healthcare choices. And she didn't quite appreciate that at the time that I said, you, your wishes are just your wishes. You know, you need to make sure that those wishes are followed through. And so you have to pick the right person. So if you have plans that you care about, you need to make sure you talk about with the right person. So in order to do it, you have to have discussion, right? You have to have legal and financial planning. And most importantly, you have to communicate. So advanced care planning is about planning for the what ifs that may occur, right? I do like to joke that this is like reverse jinxing yourself. Like if you have the plan, it won't happen. If you don't have the plan, then you're guaranteed it for it to happen. So the more you can plan for the ahead, when there's a critical decision in a crisis, the decision's already made. The questions, you know, when you're in a hospital-like setting and there's been a crisis, your loved one, or if you are the person that is the caregiver, you are going to get yelled at by staff. And it's not, they're not going to be really yelling at you, but you're going to feel like they're yelling at you because you're heightened emotionally sensitive at that moment. And these people have multiple crises they're dealing with, and they don't have the time to hold your hand. They need a decision. And if you have already made the decision in advance, it's easy because you're like, well, I know under this circumstances, this is what they want. It's not, none of it's easy. Easy is the wrong word. It's not as hard. I guess that's a better way to say it. And then it also makes sure that it is your personal values. Like I have been notoriously a control freak. And so I have very, very detailed <laughs> delineations of what I want under what circumstance for a reason. I want what I want followed for specific reasons. Um, I also, you know, have children. And if I, if something catastrophic happens to me, I need to preserve my eligibility for public benefits. I have paid into the system. The system exists to pay, to, to provide for people who can't provide for themselves. And we should be taking advantage of it because that is what it's for. And then we also definitely want to avoid formal probate proceedings. And the reason why is time, right? If you pass away in Virginia or some other state, and I use Virginia because at the time I had a client, it was very simple. He, she had a probate in Virginia and a probate in California. It was very simple to die with a probate estate in Virginia. And hers took two years to go through in California and it was very expensive. So we want to avoid that because the loss of a loved one is hard enough without the law making it harder. So some key concepts for today is, you know, estate planning. What is it? What is the administration of it? It's protection, it's distribution of assets in a manner consistent with the goals of the owner of the estate. So basically you create a plan to for your lifetime, for when you're alive and well, for when you become incapacitated, and for when you die. There's three different stages in every estate plan. The problem that I see in my business is that people wait till they're at the second stage. 
the incapacity stage. And when you wait, you can't do the proper planning or your planning options are very limited and generally require a court intercession. So we wanna do benefit planning. Determination of eligibility for public benefits and planning to prevent the depletion of assets, right? Public benefits, nobody wants to be dependent on them, but they can be a useful tool to extend the quality of your end of life. And that is what it is. We are living longer. Our diseases are, we're healthier, but our brains fall faster than any other time in history. So we really are, we're outliving our funds and we're outliving our quality of life. So we really want to kind of walk through what it's gonna look like and how we can use these. And I do have the one comment right now about talking about the changes to Medi-Cal. That is in the second half. We are gonna go through in great detail the changes to Medi-Cal and what it looks like, what we as planners are looking for, like looking towards as well as the financial aspects of it. So all of that, it's in the second half of today's presentation. Um, special needs planning, right? What happens if a person who has Alzheimer's or dementia also has a child with developmental disabilities? You know, what? these are things that we need to talk about. These are things we need to plan for. I just have a case where we just lost an adult with the disabilities because his mom passed away and they didn't have a plan. And it was such a traumatic event on this adult child that he also passed away. Similar when spouses are very intertwined and one spouse goes, the other one goes quickly. It was a very similar need in a similar situation. And it was very, it's devastating for the whole family. We're going to talk about capacity, right? The capability or fitness to perform an action or enter into a legal agreement. An ability to comprehend the nature or consequences of one's actions. That is what the standard is, right? I tell people, I don't care if you have a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's. It's irrelevant to me. People say it all the time. Well, my mom has dementia, so I need to take over. No, that's not the law. Probate Code 811 specifically says a diagnosis alone is insufficient to deem you to lack capacity. Probate Code 810, that is the statute that says you're presumed to have capacity. So in order to determine if you lack capacity, does your diagnosis interfere with your ability to understand and comprehend the nature and consequences of a specific decision? And that's a hard thing for people to grasp that just because you have a diagnosis does not take away your autonomy. You don't lose anything. I see so many people fight this disease and fight getting the proper help and support because they're afraid that when they tell anybody or if they ask for help or they get some help, they're going to lose all their autonomy. And that's not the law. And that's why I do this. If people want to know why I volunteer too much of my time and my family says I do, my staff says I do, but it's important because I want every person watching, listening, I want you to tell your friends, do not be afraid to let people know that you need some help. Because by asking for it, you are going to retain more autonomy and more control and more independence and freedom than you will by fighting it. Because if you fight it, then people are going to have to take it away from you. But if you can participate and say, I need help with this action, but I can do these nine other ones, then that's what happens. You stay in control. You may stop driving the bus, but you can still be the navigator of the bus. You know, I don't know the age range of people that are listening, but if you remember the old Thomas guy, you know, I tell the joke, like that is what it looks like. You moved from the driver's seat and now you're sitting in the passenger seat with the Thomas guy on your lap, you know, because we're not having, you know, Siri tell us where to go because you're still in control. So that's why it's important that you, you kind of ask for the help and you understand it. But if you don't do anything in advance, then you are stuck in a conservatorship. And that is a court proceeding where an individual, generally a family member, sometimes professionals, is appointed to care for the adult unable to attend to their personal needs or financial affairs. Um, thanks to Britney Spears, most people know what it is. I still can't believe I think Britney Spears as much as I do, but I do because at least they understand. And why she's a good example is because of how much money was spent in her conservatorship. I call them the nuclear option in our office. We do them more often than I'm, I would like to admit 
because that's the only option left. But they're nuclear for a reason, because it's an adversary proceeding in which you file a lawsuit against your loved one. They get their own attorney and we're going to fight and you're going to fight for their best interest against their will. And it's very exhausting, emotionally draining and, and very expensive. It's great for the attorneys. So if we can pre-plan, then none of that is required. So how do we do it? What are the legal documents? Because it's the documents that are gonna get you out of this. So basics, everybody, if you're over 18, should consider whether they need each one of these. Do you need a will? Um, there's a last will and testament, and then there's something called a pour over will. The pour over will is simply just a will that leaves everything to your trust. I always make the joke, it's like a catch all document. It catches anything out of your trust and it pours it into your trust. So that's where the name came from. I didn't make it up. Um, a trust. If you own real property in California, you need a trust. And to be honest, at this point, if because of the changes in Medi-Cal that we're going to talk about in about an hour and maybe 10 minutes, everybody should have one now. <laughs> because I don't want mistakes done with transfers of assets. I don't want any assets held outside of trust anymore. And that's gonna go towards estate recovery. Just in general, whether you have an estate that's probatable or not, I, I get worried because we don't know what the rules are gonna be when somebody passes away and a trust will avoid Medi-Cal recovery. And we're gonna get into all those details. But basically, you're going to want to trust, and I can't remember what the documents say if we go into the details. So don't mind me, I am, no. Okay, so I'm going to talk about them now. A trust. So a revocable living trust in California is not for just for rich people. I hear that all the time. Or I don't have an estate that's big enough. Or I don't have any tax problems. Those are the normal things I hear. But a revocable living trust, if you own a home, how do you sell that home, right? Or if you transfer the home, how can you transfer? You sign a deed. What can't you do when you're dead? Sign a deed. So that's why you need a trust. Because if you're if in a trust, you just define who signs your name under what circumstances. And that's it. So I sign my name when I'm alive and well. When I lose capacity, I define who can sign my name. And when I'm dead, I define who can sign my name. That's all a trust is. That's all it is. It's really simple. And so why we want it is if you don't have that, when you're dead, a judge has to decide who signs your name. And that's what probate is. That's all That's all probate is, is a judge deciding who can sign your name when you're dead. That's all. A conservatorship is who can sign your name when you're alive and incapacitated. That's all it is. So you want to trust for assets like real property. And we're going to talk about why now I think bank accounts and investment accounts are even more important to go in there. But while you're alive, if you're over 18, you have to have powers of attorney. That is a, I, you know, I don't care if you have a will because what do you care? You'll be dead. If you want to go to probate, don't have a trust. That's fine. But you have to have powers of attorney because what happened when you turned 18? That was the day that nobody could speak for you. That was the day that nobody could talk to your doctor. Nobody could talk to your bank. I make the joke. <laughs> All my kids' friends are turning 18, right? And so for their birthdays, they get powers of attorney and they're like, Mrs. McGee, I don't own anything. And I say, yes, I know, but um, you have a phone, right? And they say, well, yes. And I said, well, if you get in a car accident, what are you going to do? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I said, who's going to pay your bill? If you nobody pays your bill, you're going to lose your iCloud. You're going to lose your contacts. You're going to you know, lose your Snapchats or all the things. They freak out and say, I'll sign whatever it is, right? But we take it to a grander scale what is it that you have? You've got phone bills, you've got cable bills, you've got water bills, you've got electricity bills, you've got a paper, you, you have IRAs, you have other assets, you have lots of things that you do on a daily basis that need your signature. That's what a durable power of attorney for asset management does. Now, what about who's going to talk to your doctor, right? And these little kids, you know, they're 18 year olds. They, I shouldn't say little kids. I apologize if that offended anybody, but these 18 year olds go, well, my mom will talk to the doctor. You have to say no, HIPAA. HIPAA prevents that from happening. It is against the law for the hospital to talk to your mom. And then spouses tell me this all the time. Well, my husband or my wife or why, you know, my spouse. No, HIPAA. <laughs> it's illegal for them to tell you. 
it wasn't till COVID that it became really apparent how important it was. I would have clients calling, my husband of 64 years is in the hospital and I don't know if he's alive or dead because they wouldn't let her in, right? That was COVID. Because obviously if you're crying next to the bed, the nurse is gonna give pity on you and give you the information. But in instances when that's not okay, you're not gonna get the information. So you need a power of attorney for healthcare. In California, we're calling those now the Advanced Healthcare Directive and it nominates a power of attorney for healthcare in it. So that's uh, the next slide is detailed advanced healthcare directives. So in the olden days, we called that the living will. And in that document, we define our healthcare choices. It nominates your power of attorney for healthcare, but it also says under what circumstances do I want medical treatment? Do I want to be cremated? Do I want to be buried? Um, do I want treatment withheld if I have certain cognitive impairments and no quality of life? All the things, right? Do I want feeding tubes? You know, you want to get as detailed as you can. Um, I, there's a few hospital groups that have really good ones. So I always say, you know, find one that you like. I love the five wishes. Um, you can Google that one. That one's really good. Um, a Kaiser has a great one. Um, I'm trying to think who else is I really like because they're details. The more details you can give your loved one, the better. And for those of you who are caring with somebody suffering through dementia or Alzheimer's, you know, remember, you know, their, their cognitive abilities are fluid. So if you don't have it yet, there are times of the day after a really good night's rest, after a really good meal, after, you know, that they're really there and present with you. Ask them, don't guess, don't waste that moment. Find out, you know, give examples of what it could look like and see what, how they respond. Get that information. Um, the HIPAA waiver, the Waiver of Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act. You know, we have that a lot for extra family members too. So it's a good one to have so somebody can access your medical records, right? My dad um, the, did a great thing for us kids, right? He had, my mom was the healthcare agent. So she, technically she was the one entitled to everything, but he added me and my brothers onto having HIPAA authority. So we were able to ask questions and get to his medical records, even if we weren't a decision maker. And it, what it did is it just made everything easier. I have a brother who's a doctor. I'm a, obviously I do patient advocacy. So it was important that we could just access it and not have to jump through many hoops every time. I would really like somebody to discuss with their loved one if they want to do not resuscitate order, right? A DNR. Under what circumstances do you want to be brought back, right? How, what does it look like? You know, if you're over a certain age or your bones have become brittle, you know, do you want chest compressions? I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd ever want to have all my ribs broken and never healed for the rest of my life. I, I think those are questions you need to talk to your doctor about. And in doing that, that's what the physician's order for life-sustaining treatment is. That is the pulse. It's the pink paper. And if you talk to your doctor and um, they, you say, I want the pink paper, it's an actual appointment you make with the doctor. And I see some questions coming in so because they're very rel relatable right now. So I'm going to is there a difference between an advanced health care and power of attorney for care, which we have with Kaiser? So the Kaiser one that I'm thinking of, it's an advanced health care directive. And in that document, it nominates and appoints your power of attorney for health care. So it's usually it's one document that I know of. I don't know that they have two separate ones. So you just kind of go through it. And I think the first or second question is, who do you nominate as your power of attorney? And then it goes into your, your wishes. And then is there a form or document which can be used in the medical health services, say with a primary doctor or physician in charge of health of a person in question? So I think that's where the answer is the advanced health care directive is what you're asking. Yes. So in my experience, very few medical providers will keep them on file. The VA will, um, and every time I had to go to a certain hospital here in town, it was bad. It was like every two weeks for a loved one of mine. And every time we had to bring the power of attorney and he's like, don't they keep it on file? And no, they don't keep it on file. They say they do, but they didn't. So just, you know, if you have a loved one suffering through current medical conditions, carry it with you. Um, your advanced health care directive, my mom always joked, you know, because I was just a child. What do I know? And I always said, put it on your refrigerator. 
and keep it in your glove box and because it doesn't have any private information. So the reason why is in an accident, the paramedics are trained to look in your glove box and they're also trained to look on your fridge. And so when my father had a health event, my mother at the hospital, she was like, gosh, you know, you were so right. When the last paramedic was leaving, he walked through the kitchen, looked at the fridge for our advanced health care directive. And I said, I, I know this is what I do, but that's where they're going to look for it. And so you want to make it easy on people. Like, don't take these and stick them in a safe deposit box because then nobody knows it exists because you can't get access to that safe deposit box without the document. So make sure people have them. So, and make sure that they are current. Um, right, so there's one question. So the question just came up. I have sent questions this morning. Could you please address them? What I'm going to need um, that person to be a little more clear on the questions. Um, Okay, so maintaining current documents. Review existing estate plans regularly. And whenever there's a significant change, change them, right? <laughs> so the idea is people ask me, when do we make changes? And I tell people the standard. Every five years, take a look at it. Every major life event, take a look at it. Every And as we age and things become a little more prevalent where they're going to be used more likely based on age or diagnoses, have a check every year or so. Um, but the reason why you want to talk about major life events is that it could be something as simple as my, my friend's husband got sick and I saw what happened. Or we had another health event in our family and I saw how they acted. I get the good example is my, when my father had his first health event, I saw how my brother acted. Now my brother's a doctor and my brother was my backup healthcare agent. I came back to work the next day and changed it. And it's not that I don't love him. And it's not that he's not a capable, very, very, very good doctor. It was how he advocated is not how I want him to advocate for me. And so basically you look at what happens and how they handle that. And you say, is this what I want? And is this what works for me? So major life events will do that. Um, birth, deaths, those kind of things, also a very big time. So you really want to regularly check and ensure beneficiary designations are up to date. I have, in my experience, most people think they're correct. They did them in 1982 and they would never change. Well, there's been a lot of technology increases over the years. Companies switch programs, that beneficiary designations may not transfer as easily with some of them. There are people think that they put their spouse and then they put their kids, but they never actually did as the secondary. Or if we did some planning, did you, do you have it, your trust? Did something happen? Was there a health event, a life event? new children came, you know, grandchildren, things like that. Have we really updated them or did we think we updated them? And I would, I'm going to tell you, they, I'm shocked at how many people swear up and down that they had it right. And then they get them and they're like, this, I guess you're, you, you may have been correct. It happens a lot. So just update, just check. It's easy. Now it's all online. You go in, check, or you make the phone call, sit on hold for an hour and say, can you send me a copy of my beneficiary designations? And then please, 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 please let somebody know where they are. Just let somebody know. Um, you don't have to give it to them, right? This is your private information. I get that. I don't, nobody has a copy of mine, but my backup agents know where to find it in an emergency. That's what I want. I'm not saying hand it out because you're going to make changes. Some people hand it out, but make sure they know where it is. Like it's on the second shelf in my office or it's in the third drawer in the filing cabinet. Or, you know, I've put you on my safe deposit box and the key is over here. You know, make sure that somebody knows where it is and that they have access to it. So any questions right now on just this stage? <clears throat> That was me going. Oh. We... Coming back, trying to come back on camera. Uh -huh. okay. There. So let me go back. There. Okay. 
So you've been answering questions of things have gone along here, Kim. That's been terrific. And let's see. Okay. So it looks like so. Actually... Yeah, I think the one that you asked for some clarification on was questions re legal information needed at time of death and other needed info. So when people pass, um, so what I what I always like to say is it's more important right now when people are alive. So what do we need, right? We need those powers of attorney. That's what we need. As somebody who's making the plans, what you also need is to know where everything is, right? People like, okay, well, you nominated these agents to act for you, but they don't know where your bank accounts are. They don't know what investment accounts you are. They don't know what insurance you have. They don't know what bills you have. You know, that's a lot. And so what is really helpful is to keep track of it. Now, I I am not a person who is going to keep every statement. I, I hate clutter. I just, it's too much. And generally, if I do, it'll just stick in a pile and then that's no good for anybody. But what I am, I can do, because I commit to this every year, is I have my plan and I have my booklet. You know, I have a little binder. And at the end of the year, you get end of year statements. Right. It comes in for all your investment accounts, your bank accounts, your IRAs, your security, you know, all the stuff. You get tax bills, you get all the stuff. And you take, you put them in your binder. You take out last year's, you put in this year's. That's all. You know, um, right now we're kind of dealing with this whole over like passwords. What do we do? And I don't have an answer for that because, you know, I can't say keep a list of your passwords somewhere because then it gets stolen and then, you know, all that. So that one is something you kind of have to be whatever you're comfortable with, because that is a problem is password and access. So you're best off since all of our statements are online, actually printing one of everything so that somebody can access that. Because even if they can't access your online account, they can still call with the account number, your social security number, all, all the information and be able to access it. Because your power of attorney will give the instructions as to when somebody can. It will say, upon my incapacity, based on two letters by two physicians that I lack the ability to manage my financial affairs. They, I have to lose capacity. They get two doctors to say I lost capacity and then my agent can go and act for me. I have a lot of people that don't want to sign these documents because they're afraid they're going to lose some sort of control. You define when they become effective. Spouses generally make them effective to each other immediately because it's your spouse and you trust them. But majority of non-spouse situations will make them called, it's called springing. It means they will only become effective upon an event. Two doctors deeming me to lack capacity. There's other things I have seen, uh, capacity determinators. You know, you pick two family members to decide when you're, you know, incapacitated. I don't like that because I've seen some bad family members, but whatever's comfortable for you. So that's the lead, that's that side. When you pass, you're going to need a death certificate. You're going to need either a will that gets probated. Ideally, you have your trust that defines who the second in command is, right? You've said, well, I am the manager of my trust when I'm alive because it's my money. But if I die, then I name Sarah. And Sarah is the person who gets to take over. So she has to get a death certificate and my trust. And then she can go and conduct all my business. So long as I put everything in my trust. So that's the big, that's the, that's the important part. When we're talking about trust, well, a trust is just paper until you do something with it, right? I, I always think, Picture your trust as a bucket and it's a bucket that you put stuff in. And if you don't put anything in, it's just an empty bucket. So you put your house in. How do you put your house in? Hopefully your attorney. And if they didn't double check, and you can double check by looking at your property tax statement. That's a very easy, simple way without having to spend any money. And does it come in the name of a trust? Your trust. If it's your personal name, we need to get a copy of your current deed. If it's in the name of your trust, you're pretty much, you're probably okay. And I say probably because I've seen weird things. But the idea is how do you do it? You say, well, I, uh, and if you're, if you're a single woman, you know, Kimberly McGee is a single woman, hereby grants to Kimberly McGee as trustee of the McGee Family Trust. That's all it is to fund my trust. Just me mm. transferring it to me. <laughs> but with my new last name, common trustee. And the same thing with a bank. 
I go to the bank, I take my trust and I say, banker, please put this in my trust. And they say, fill out this form and we'll put it in your trust. And then they'll say, would you like new, new checks? And I'll say, no, thank you. I like my name on my checks. Not that we use checks anymore, but that's, it's, it's very simple, right? You know, your Vanguard accounts, your Fidelity accounts, those ones are just the same. You probably can go online, click a button, get the form, fill it out and mail it in. So it's usually pretty simple to fund your trust. It's just, you have to take that one extra affirmative step. So when mm -hmm. all of that's done, generally all you need when someone dies is the trust and a death certificate. And that's why I, I like the compliment that clients can give that this is a very hard time and your planning didn't make it worse, <laughs> right? That's what you want to do for your loved ones. You want a, I can't make it better, but we don't have to make it worse. And so a lot of people who don't do the planning, it's years of trying to collect everything. It's years of dealing with the court. It's years of spending money that we didn't have to spend. So the idea is take control now. So another question is who do you name when you have no relatives in the U.S. or friends you would name? Uh, I have I have people that would be happy to be my agents and trustees. I have you know siblings and good friends, but I don't like that because I want a professional. <laughs> I want in my mind I'm very good at running my own life. Um, and I don't think anybody's going to be as good as me unless they do it for a living. <laughs> and that's just how I feel because it's a job. And I watch a lot of lay people try to step in and jump into other people's lives. And that's really hard because they have their own lives. You know, I have people nominate people as their successor trustees, you know, very capable, very capable family members, but you know, they're CFOs of some corporation. Well, of course that person's going to do a good job but they're a CFO of a corporation. They don't have the time to sit on a hold for four hours with Fidelity to get access to your account. You know, they don't have five and a half hours to sit in the lobby of Bank of America to try to get access to a safe deposit box. That's a real case. So that's why I say it, right? It's a lot of work. So there are professional trustees that do it for a living. Um, there's um, a Netflix movie that, you know, kind of poo pooed professionals, but I feel it was based on some bad actors in New Mexico and Nevada. That stuff can't happen here in California the way that played out because we have so many protections here. There are bad apples out there, yes. But I can't remember the exact number. Um, one of my colleagues just, just, just listed it. It was like 92 or 98, something extremely high of all elder financial abuse is done by family members. And it is these professionals that come in and save the day. So that movie really did some harm because it, it took away from the professionals who, this is their job. This is all they do. They're licensed, they're bonded. They, like I tell people, no offense, but your estate isn't big enough for them to lose their license. Like it's just not worth it to them. <laughs> they like what they do. They're good at what they do. They're generally advocates. They're a lot of former financial planners, social workers, people who have just really good hearts and want to help people get into that practice of a profession. So I have a professional fiduciary. And if she gets hit by the bus, I have a backup to her. And if she gets hit by the bus, I have a backup to her. And you can interview them. They don't get paid until they start working. So you can interview, you can pick them, you can change your mind. I mean, all that thing. So I highly recommend exploring that if you don't have a person. Like a lot of times the adult child is a good idea. They're going to get everything. They're going to take care of you anyway. But if they're the CFO of, you know, San Francisco General Hospital, they don't have time to fly down in an emergency. Just remember who you're picking and if they can do it. Any you know, other the, Go ahead. <laughs> there's another, there's a question here that I'm going to try and condense that I think is good though. It's, I think really the crux of it is, can you tell us really what is the difference between an estate planning attorney or an attorney in elder care law? Is one, you know, kind of more knowledgeable about the issues that we are facing as we're growing older? Uh, should we have one of each involved in our planning or what, you know, give us a little guidance there. 
So um, if you go on to the California Lawyers Association's web website, there's a podcast that we did um, specifically, another elder law attorney and I did, it's a 20 minutes that walks the full details of the differences of an estate planning and an elder law attorney. And the reality just kind of breaks down in, I want every estate planning attorney to become an elder law attorney, except the ones that focus in tax. The, the tax the tax ones, they should stay in the tax world. But because we need them because I don't want to know about that. But what I do want is an elder. How do I the best way to say this is every elder law attorney can do estate planning, but estate planners can't do elder law. So, you know, it could be like the estate planner on steroids. And an elder law attorney's basic documents that they create and draft for a plan are very, are very similar, if not identical, to what an estate planner will provide. The only real difference is that the elder law attorney kind of changes the focus more on lifetime planning rather than death planning. So we do a lot more planning for what it's going to look like. You know, we kind of discuss those issues. We're going to talk about how you pay for the long-term care. We're going to really walk through the, like, what is a conservatorship? Why are we putting a nomination of a conservator in your powers of attorney? And that's because a power of attorney cannot usurp their principles. So if you're an agent under a power of attorney, right, you're named as to act for mom and mom wants to run around the streets naked as the power of attorney, you don't get to stop her. That, I mean, the police can stop her, but you can't stop her. And the same thing if my, you know, my mom wants to give all her money to the Nigerian lottery as her agent under a power of attorney, I can't stop her. I have to get a conservatorship to stop her. So the idea is, you know, we kind of walk through some of those issues to almost like pre-plan and stop them from happening and to kind of help navigate like, okay, so this is an elder law attorney is going to work with your financial planner. If you don't have one, we're, we kind of have an idea of costs of what does long-term care look like? Do you want to be in a facility? What kind of community? How do you want to stay at home? What are you going to need to stay at home? What is it going to look like as a hybrid? How do we take veterans benefits and how do we take Medi-Cal options and utilize those to keep you within what you want, right? Um, I have a good estate plan right now that we're working on, husband and wife. Wife has diagnosis of Alzheimer's, still capable of participating, and they have no children, so they don't care about leaving a legacy. And we are able to create an estate plan that includes their long-term care plan and how we're going to utilize Medi-Cal for IHSS, in-home supportive services, how we're going to then use day programs because he's kind of like a, he just wants to stay at home and garden and read books. And she is a very vibrant woman. She's going to go to day programs covered by Medi-Cal. We're going to be able to utilize the equity in his home. Like we found a plan that's going to work for the next 20 years. And that was really, that's what the elder law attorney is going to focus on, not just what happens if you die tomorrow. So I, I, there's a long-winded way of saying that. That's a, that's a good answer. And I really appreciate it because sometimes I get asked those questions and I've never really known how to answer it. So thank you very much. Yeah. I'm going it's, to go it's more off. Of a, the, like what happened was estate planning was the standard. And then as people started living longer, we started realizing mm -hmm. the need for a broader scope of knowledge. It's a lot right. harder. That's why there's a lot fewer of us um, because you do have to add in a lot of different things. Which and is so, some of the stuff we're gonna come to next. Yeah. So I'm oh, gonna go off yeah. camera. And there is somebody and... just asked, are there many elder law attorneys available? And the mm -hmm. answer is no, um, unfortunately. So in California, there's only 26 certified elder law attorneys. Um, I am one of them. In San Diego, we only have four. Um, two of them, unfortunately, are not practicing in this area. One person is doing rich people planning. And then the, uh, I say that nicely, but high-end uh, complicated tax planning, uh, which I'm glad because people, we still need that and I don't want to do it. And then somebody who has moved on to um, elder financial abuse litigation, which is phenomenal because we need that. Um, but this kind of planning, there are non-certified elder law attorneys in San Diego, and we have, I would say we have like six or seven really good ones. Um, we also have people who advertise as elder law attorneys, and they're not. Um, and it bothers me, but because they maybe do conservatorships 
as a side, they consider that enough of elder law. So legally, I don't think they're really bending the rules, but like the, I've had clients go to them and then I say they need to talk about Medi-Cal and they're like, we don't do that. Well, if they don't do Medi-Cal and veterans planning, they can't be deemed an elder law. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do we need an attorney to handle the paperwork and filing with the state immediately or before the loved one dies? So before someone passes away, there's really nothing to file because it's your private life and we don't require that. Um, an attorney to handle after they pass, I say yes, only because it you don't know what you don't know. And especially if there are multiple beneficiaries, California has very strict rules. We have, you have deadlines. You have 60 days to do, you know, give notice to the beneficiaries. You have certain requirements to file with the IRS. You have a lot of things you have to do. And if you don't, you're deemed to breach your fiduciary duty and could be liable to the heirs and you could lose part of your inheritance because of it. And so I recommend that you at least consult with an attorney to see what your duties are um, whether you hire them or not, that's different, right? Because there are books and there are, you know, everything is available. I think that the law has made it too complicated so that you have to have a lawyer. So my personal opinion is you shouldn't have to have one, but ideally if everything's done really well for pre-planning, there's not much that needs to be done after death. Like it, it, there's some California requirements, but there's a lot of things you can waive. And so that's why the pre-planning is so important. There's a comment here or a question uh, in chat on, there's a list on the ALS website, Alzheimer's San Diego, um, of attorneys, are they all certified as elder law attorneys? No, they are not. Just as Ms. McGee just said, there's, she's listed on it and, you know, another Phil, elder law. Yeah, Phil's on there. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Lindsley. And then other attorneys and estate planners are listed on it who have established practices with a, a focus and or an expressed interest in, you know, working with the elderly, with uh, families facing issues of aging and dementia. So, but they're not certified elder law attorneys with the exception of Ms. McGee and Mr. Lindsley. And again, as I said, like you don't, the certification, and let me kind of clarify because I do not want to diminish some of the very good elder law attorneys we have in San Diego. The, the CELA designation is a national designation. So California, we're an island to ourselves and we're gonna get into that in detail in the next hour. <laughs> and so we, in order to become a nationally certified, you have to learn the federal, basically the other state's rules. And then you also have to take another, you have to take a test that works nationwide. And then you have to take another California specific one. So it's a lot, and there's a lot of like, a lot of things, to, hoops to jump through to become it. So it just because they don't have the designation does not make them qualified. Um, mm -hmm. what, what I recommend to people is if your attorney, when you ask them questions and they get defensive, you need to end that meeting and walk out because they don't know what they're doing. No service provider, whether it's a doctor, lawyer, architect, engineer, accountant, you know, anybody, Anybody that gets offended by you questioning them, you, they don't know what they're doing and it's time to leave. It's just, that is your red flag because anybody who's good at what, they're do, what they do are happy to talk about it, number one. We're usually pretty big geeks about it and we'll just, they'll talk too much. Or we're willing to say, I don't know, let me figure that out for you. Those, that is somebody you want because we as elder law attorneys have a very big network of other attorneys that were like, I've never seen this before. What do we do? And that's what we're here for because we're all doing it because we care. We yeah. took the time to do it. Very good advice, I think. Okay. We um, will move on to the second half here and I'm gonna take myself off camera and on mute and hopefully I can do it without advancing slides. Let's see. <laughs> Okay, I advanced the slide. Let's see if that works. Okay, strategies for financing this long-term care now that we've kind of gone through it all. Um, how are we gonna pay for it, right? What does it look like? I'm trying to advance the slide, sorry. Okay, so what is really long-term care? What What is it? 
long-term and we call it custodial care in, in the business, right? Um, it refers to the services, supports, and care settings that provide non-medical assistance with activities of daily living. So there are ADLs, you're going to hear about these as people become, as they become necessary. And it's for individuals with physical or cognitive disabilities. And so it's non-medical because there's a difference. And we're going to talk about the Medicare and Medi-Cal difference. But we're talking about if I need help bathing, dressing, feeding, transferring, which is moving from bed to chair, chair to bed, um, toileting and continent issues. Um, VA has recently added medicine maintenance to their list. So if you have long-term care insurance, or if we're talking about Medi-Cal, or we're talking about VA, or we're even talking about you know other types of what's needed in different licensing for, for communities, that's what your ADL is. And so it's provided in different avenues, right? You've got community-based. Community-based would be anything that keeps people out of a facility. Um, and community would be in-home care, right? So you're staying in your home, adult day programs. And as I told you, we have the best plan that we came up for this person because this couple, like they can't ever be apart. Like they just can't, he loves her so much. Oh, I just, it just breaks my heart that, that, you know, her, her memory is going to go because he's, she's not going to remember all the amazingness of their life. And that's sad to me because, gosh, they, it, you don't see that all the time. And I just love it. So we're going to be able to keep her at home for until there's a major catastrophic event. Because we're going to be able to use in-home care, supplemented with adult day, pro, adult day programs. And PACE is like the greatest thing ever. So adult day programs, Medi-Cal is going to, it has them. They also have, you know, out-of-pocket ones. Um, uh, let's see. I can't, it just escaped me right now. Glenner Center is probably one of like the most phenomenal places you can find um, out of pocket costs. And then the PACE programs have adult day programs as well. Um, if you're up here in the North, you got the Mary and Gary West PACE program, which thank, uh, thank you for Mary and Gary West. I just like can't sing their praises anymore. You've got, so what it does is for this couple, it's a perfect example. They've got a bus that's gonna pick her up at eight and give her breakfast, lunch. She's going to have, cause she was a caterer and she's got all these phenomenal recipes. She's going to have cooking classes, art classes, singing classes. She's going to be able to do things and be the social butterfly that she's always been when her husband stayed at home because <laughs> he has to be her socialness and he's not good at that. And uh, just so sweet. And then she comes home at three. And so then he's had all day of a break and he is rejuvenated and ready to be her care provider. And then, you know, she also, they can also have in-home care on the days where that doesn't happen. And so bathing and things, things that, you know, maybe they don't want to do, you know, he doesn't want to be doing that for her. And just because of the way their relationship has been. And, you know, generally, uh, I don't want to sound awful, but, you know, the, the nurturing maternal is not generally the paternal side. So it, it's harder on certain times like that, not for everybody, but in certain situations. And so pace is a great option. So PACE, one of the reasons we like PACE so much is there is in the South as well, um, but it provides people with care management. It helps people manage things. It does transportation. It it provides the services that you don't know you don't know, that you don't know you need. <laughs> and so being, you know, finding it and, and working with it, it, it adds that level of security and maybe other benefits you didn't think of. There's the residential care options, which are, you know, assisted livings. So they're called residential care facilities for the elderly and RCFEs. And those are your assisted living. So you've got like the big, like a big apartment complexes that have the restaurant, right? And they provide care. Then you have the memory care, which are the locked, smaller apartment type places. And then you have boarding cares. If you don't know what a boarding care is, in and, and in your neighborhood, there could be a house that has six residents and the care is provided in that house. And that's a boarding care. Um, they have a special exception to HOAs, which is why they're usually separated out, which means that people can have them and an HOA can't kick them out. So you can have a home business. And then there's the skilled nursing care. That is what we call institutional care. And that California has a public policy against it. 
So it's helpful to know that, you know, when you're looking at benefits available, the public policy is to keep people out of skilled nursing. Skilled nursing sometimes becomes the only option. Number one, if you do have a skilled nursing level of care, like you need medical services, rehab services, intravenous drugs, you know, um, you have maybe severe open wounds that need constant treatment. Those kind of things would be medical services. Custodial services would just be room and board. And I have cases where, you know, the problem is, is that the, the person lacks so much strength that they become so bed bound that they have no choice but to stay in a nursing level of care because they need a Hoyer lift or something else like that, which is those big moving things. Um, so those are the, that's like really what long-term care looks like, but now how do we pay for it, right? It's every year I do this, I just get more deflated when I think about the cost because it just keeps going up and it's the unintended consequences that that I just don't think people appreciate with, you know, wage and hour laws and things like that. Because, you know, in home care, I haven't gotten the 2024 numbers yet. Um, I did ask uh, some care companies, but you're looking upwards at $35,000 a month. And that would be uh, if you want the same caregiver or the same two, or two caregivers, um, because we have wage and hour laws, you have to be mindful of that. That every eight hours, you know, anything over eight hours is going to be time and a half. Anything over 16 hours is double time. You have to give certain breaks. You have to do, you have to follow those basic wage and hour laws. So it's hard with people with cognitive impairments because they need consistency. So it's hard when you have like a revolving door of caregiving. So that makes it very hard to do in-home care. In-home care, you know, can be supplemented with family caregivers and, you know, spouses and things like that. But it's kind of one of those problems you run into with, is it, is it worth the money? And part of it is I've seen home care be really bad for people because there's no oversight, right? Um, I've had cases where people can afford it, no problem, but their loved ones live on the East Coast. So they have private care come in. Nobody's watching that person and they're being neglected. So the one thing that you run into with residential care and skilled is that there are people coming in and out. There's family members visiting other people. So you have a little bit more oversight. And I just throw that out because it's like a real concern that I personally had with clients. Um, adult day programs, those can range from Medi-Cal covering it. And so you have a maybe a copay. I've seen the VA, um, if there is space in an adult day program for the VA because they will contract with other places. It can be $20 a day. And then it could be very expensive if you go to some of the higher end. But I always say it's kind of worth it because you're going to look at what you get for it. Um, some people need that stimulation, especially when we do have cognitive impairment. The more stimulation, the slower the decline. So you kind of have to figure out what works. But some people behaviorally, it's not a good fit. So you got to kind of look. Um, and then PACE, PACE is a Medi-Cal program. Um, so we, if you're qualified for Medi-Cal, you really can just walk into either the Gary Mary West PACE or down at St. Paul's and kind of just get on the program. Um, it's very simple and they are there to help you. Like they want to help you and it's so great. Um, residential care facilities, so boarding cares, some of them can be the most cost effective because they they run really well. A really well run one, especially if somebody has multiple, then they kind of spread the cost out. Those in general, I always say I see them between 3,500, you know, I've seen some up to 15,000, but that's very high end. You know, they got views of the ocean and all sorts of things. But generally, you know, the 3,500 to the 5,500 is not an uncommon boarding care amount. Um, and that when you're thinking about it, you you got to remember that's all inclusive. So you don't have all these, you know, additional things. So when you're looking at assisted living facilities and memory cares, assisted livings, those can also range very similar to boarding care, but then you start adding on services. And that's where people start to get up to the 7,800, you know, things like that, because they start adding on care needs. So you got to kind of look, but assisted livings are great for people that like that big community feel. Memory cares, uh, I'm thinking 5,500 to 15,000, I know of one. Um, 
the higher functioning ones are usually around 10,000 and the, the lesser functioning I've noticed around 7,500 because you're, you're paying for the services, like, you know, how much so you're going to look at. So, and what do you need? Skilled nursing, um, our average private pay rate is about 15,000 in California. Um, well, I think it's about 12,000, but San Diego is about 15,000 a month. So it is a high, very high cost. So how do we pay for it? Like, what is the most common things? So your personal savings and assets, that's how people pay for it, right? I, when people come in, we talk about what are your long-term goals, right? I have some people, their long-term goals are leaving a legacy. I have some people whose long-term goals are spending the kids' inheritance, ski vacations, as we like to joke. But the idea is some people are like, I just don't want to be a burden. And then we walk that through. Um, other people are like, I don't care. Throw me in a, you know, the worst Medi-Cal facility there is. Lock, you know, lock me in there and save, give that, save, save everything for my heirs because that's the only reason I work for it. Everyone is different and there's no right or wrong answer and it's none of our decision to decide what's right or wrong. Um, Long-term care insurance. This, if you have it, keep paying on it. Under all circumstances, keep paying on it. Um, it can get quite expensive, but it can be very beneficial. Right now, long-term care insurance, because the actuaries were so wrong, <laughs> the actuaries are the uh, people that decide how long people are going to live when they're deciding uh, the risk factors for insurance. They did not anticipate the longevity that was going to start happening with the advancements in medical care. And so right now there's a correction. And so a lot of time long-term care insurance is like, if you can afford it, you can self-insure is the joke we all have right now. But doesn't mean there's not options, right? There's life insurance that has long-term care riders. Um, but if you have it, it's going to be good because it's going to really give you more options for care. But the financial tools, um, reverse mortgages, those are a dirty word if they're used improperly. Um, I have had to have many of a hard conversation about people with their long-term care choices because they decided to take a reverse mortgage out and use it at the casino. And that is their choice, but their life choices left them with very limited long-term care choices. Because the reverse mortgage, and that's actually part of the plan that I'm doing for this husband and wife, we're not taking out a lump sum. Your reverse mortgage guy is going to try to talk you into a lump sum. And I'm just letting you know that. And, you know, if they get offended when they hear it from me, I don't care. And that the reason why is if you get a reverse mortgage out, you can get what they call a, you know, a line of credit where you can get up to 50% of the value of your home in a line of credit. Meaning I don't have to touch it, but it's available. And that means there's no interest compounding on it. Your reverse mortgage guy will, guy or gal, will get a commission for that. But if they talk you into a lump sum, they're going to get like double the commission. So either way, you have access to the same amount of money. They get paid more on one side than they do the other. But the problem is, is that if you have a lump sum of money, you're going to spend it. Most people do, right? Unless you are very good at like, well, I can pull this out of my house and invest it into this. And, you know, that's a tool and we should use it. But be mindful of how to use it, what you're using it for. Um, the There's also charitable gift annuities. So in the event that you have a highly appreciated piece of property, this is where it really works well. So let's say that I have, you know, I've had this, you know, a rental home forever, or I've got a second home that, you know, just kind of sat there and now it's really worth a lot of money. But if, you know, I bought it at 30,000 and now it's worth 800,000. But if I sold it, I have to pay taxes, capital gains on 730, $770,000. The lawyer doing math is never a good idea, sorry. But you can do a charitable gift annuity um, to defer all of those capital gains and still be able to utilize that money. And what they're great about it is if you're charitably inclined, you can, you can create, you can put this money into an annuity, this hot, this property into an annuity or the proceeds of the property, get the benefit of income from it. And then when you pass, it can go to the charity. And like, so like 
for example, Alzheimer's San Diego could be the named beneficiary. So you don't actually have to donate during your life. You get the benefit of receiving all the income without any capital gains. And then whatever's left can go to Alzheimer's or something like that. It's just an example, but there's all the chair, every charity kind of has it. So it's phenomenal. And it's a really good use of highly appreciated property. You can also convert life insurance. I, when I learned about this, I just thought how many people wasted, um, you know, you're paying on a life insurance policy and you just can't pay it anymore. The premiums are too high. You can't pay it anymore. Or, you know, I really need access to this while I'm alive. There's a secondary market that will buy it. So I was able to, <laughs> I was shocked when um, I found this out, like with a client, because I, you know, I knew this company existed and you know, I luckily happened to work at a company that knew these people. And I was really shocked because it was a term life insurance policy. I didn't think it'd have any money. The woman got $33,000 off a of term life insurance for a hundred thousand. I was like blown away because it was going to expire. <laughs> so the fact that somebody was willing to buy it. So don't just stop paying on things. I think if, if there's anything I can express, don't stop paying on things. Um, Medicaid, which in California we call Medi-Cal, and we're going to kind of go through more of the details, but that is something that is going to help with different types of long-term care. And then you also have VA benefits. And now the VA benefits are going to be um, different types for different people, but generally you're looking at if you are the veteran, you are going to be up to, you know, get maybe... $1,800 and I'm just kind of rounding the numbers out a month to help pay for care. And if you're married up to 2,300 and if you're a surviving spouse, about 1,400. And the idea is, is that if you're incurring cost, they will help reimburse it. So we kind of use it as a tool in the math and we're going to kind of get into those details. Let's not forget when we're doing long-term care planning that it's a team, right? And a good planner whether it be your CPA, your financial planner, your lawyer, we want the whole team. I, I just spoke on the changes of Medi-Cal to San Diego Financial Planning Association. And every single person in that room has a state planner or other attorney in their network for a reason, because we want to have a planner. We want to have a plan, a team, and we all have a CPA one, probably 10, right? That we also want to be involved. I say that when you come to me, I want your CPA's number and I want you to call your CPA and tell them they can talk to me because I want to make sure that we are maximizing everything because what people don't realize is that a lot of these expenses could end up being tax deductions. We can maximize the use of different assets and funds in a crisis to benefit you. And so what, because the goal, right, is we're just trying to extend out your long-term care, your life, your quality of life. We're trying to take the money you have and extend it. So this, a lot of people say, well, I don't need a CPA because I'm not rich enough. And, you know, in the olden days before the changes of Medi-Cal, you know, us elder law attorneys, we used rich people planning these fancy, really fancy types of trust to qualify people for Medi-Cal. So, and we still use the complicated tax planning in order to have people benefit from them. So it's not just a rich person problem. And that's why I say we need these tax attorneys because I, I need them. But you could be using, you know, required minimum distributions or IRA funds that would be normally income taxable. And if you're receiving in-home care services, residential care, you're, you know, in a facility, other non-covered medical expenses, certain personal care items, medical equipment, home modifications, long-term care insurance premiums, you can be offsetting it. So you could be taking out taxable income, offset it with medical deductions. And so you just, uh, you just took more money out than you would have otherwise. So be mindful. Don't just do. Talk to qualified people and you know, like there, we love to do this. We like to talk too much, obviously. Um, so enjoy it. Take advantage of us. Um, we're going to jump to employment considerations. I know there was a couple people that had it. So 
if you have an early diagnosis, meaning, you know, you're still working or your loved one's still working, you've got, you know, you're the primary breadwinner or something like that, or you're the caregiver of somebody who is suffering from some sort of major neurocognitive disorder, you know, we want to consider how do we disclose it? I don't want anybody getting fired because of their disease, because it's a disability, right? We, there are employment lawyers who we can refer to, to kind of help navigate how to do this. The reason why it's important to disclose it is that it, it is a, di a disability. You do get the benefit of requesting accommodations. I one time had a vet who uh, had got a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and he was able to continue working for quite a while. He was a surgeon. His surgery career ended, but he was still able to do a lot of work in his clinic. And so those, mo those accommodations really worked out well because it helped create this longer plan, right? There was still income coming in, things like that. Um, there's also employee assistance programs. Um, so, cause you don't know, right? I had one client didn't know that their work had all of these options <laughs> that they had a long-term care insurance plan through their employer and didn't know that they did. So if they would have gotten fired, they would have lost the right to it. So it was very important not to keep this a secret. I feel like you should do it in conjunction with counsel, just because I, navigating that can be difficult and there are bad actors everywhere. But there could be short-term disability benefits, long-term disability benefits. And then there's also the Family Medical Leave Act benefits that can maybe give you more time. Uh, maybe you get paid for longer. Maybe as the caregiver, you can take more time off, more paid time off. Non-paid time off is still have a job to go back to while you're trying to navigate this horrendous part of your life. And then also early retirement, you know, you don't have, but if you get fired, you lose those options. And so that's where disclosure is important. Okay, so compassion and allowances is also very important. So if you are below, you know, the age of receiving um, social security, there's a compassionate allowances initiative. And what it does is it expedites the processing of your SSDI insurance and your SSI disability claim. What that means, right? So as social security disability insurance, SSDI, that is if you have paid into social security or have been married to somebody who has paid into social security for more than 40 quarters, which is 10 years of employment, you are entitled to SSDI. It is basically taking your social security when you become retirement age, you're gonna take it early because of a disability. And supplemental security income, SSI, is if you did not pay into the system, then you are unable to collect it. So if you have that, and you, know, you have one of these diagnoses, you get an expedited review and qualification because it can take a long time. So if you have young onset Alzheimer's, frontal temporal dementia, um, that is a big one that I see, um, ALS, Lewy body, I see these ones often. Primary progressive aphasia is something I see often too. And then some types of, some of the mixed dementias. So what you can do is you can access benefits earlier. So the younger you are, you know, you got to realize that I may be able to get things faster because of my diagnosis. So make sure when you're applying for these things, you look at the compassion and allowances. Social security workers will help you through it, but they need to know it's an option. Okay, Ooh, I'm stuck. Try this again. Okay, veterans benefits. So I kind of touched on these a few minutes ago, but with your veterans benefits. So if you have served in the military and generally we're gonna talk about active duty because um, there's some reservists who can't qualify for some of these, but some, and that's not really what we're gonna talk about, but for active duty, you've got your health insurance. There's so much negative press about VA health insurance and that applies, I think, to some states. I feel like it's an unfair statement for California. Especially, well, for San Diego, I take that back. San Diego does have a very good VA system. Um, I don't think it's any better or any worse than 
majority of our other medical systems. In fact, I do think it's better than one particular I can think of. Um, so we care in San Diego in particular about the, our veterans and our health insurance is good. Even if you don't want it, um, get your hearing aid because that's free and that's what $6,000. So I could just save you $6,000 by sitting through here. It may take six months, but get your free hearing aids from the VA. Um, so your medical care, again, you know, it's a great option. The VA hospital is a great hospital. Um, what There's also service-connected disability income. This is if you were injured in the line of duty. Now, it doesn't mean you got shot at a war. It means that while you were on active duty, you were injured. That's all. And that injury has caused some sort of disability. You know, you when you are on active duty, it is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You don't get to just go on vacation, right? They kind of frown on that. They do call it AWOL. So if you are playing basketball and twist your knee while on active duty, that is still a service-connected disability. So I did have a client once who came in all very hunched over. And, you know, he was only about 70, 72, something like that. And I said, you know, God, you know, he was in severe pain. And he's like, yeah, I was in this, um, I was in basic training and I was, I'm going to get the story wrong a little, but he was either the only Air Force guy on a army base or the only army guy on a Air Force base, one of the two. And they were doing the um, training where they do the ejector seat and they put, you know, they put charges at the bottom and then they, you know, eject people. Well, they thought it'd be funny to add extra charges to his. It shot him up. You know, his back went flying in. It got stuck up there. You know, long story. But at 18 years old, he healed. At 72, those injuries created major damage. So he didn't realize that he could go get service-connected disability. And he did. And he got fully 100% rated. And he was now getting a $7,200 check a month. He didn't know this whole time. Had no idea he was entitled to it. So... If you were injured in the line while you were in active duty, please evaluate. As you age, let's say you're 30% rated because you have some sort of injury. Those injuries will probably progress on because of aging. So, you know, hearing gets worse. All, you know, arthritis gets worse. Back injuries get worse. Knee injuries get worse. You can increase your ratings depending on if it's the severity. So don't just be, you know, stick with what you had. If things are progressing, go back, go back to the veterans office, the veterans affairs office, not the medical. Now, remember that the VA benefits office is different than the VA medical office. They do not talk. I still don't think they have com computers that communicate. So if you're telling your VA doctor one thing, do not think they're going to the benefits department. Just remember that. And people think they do, but they do not. Then we also have the pension benefits. You have your, you know, traditional, which is what you're kind of thinking of. Um, I work 20 years, I get my benefit. There's that. But there's also non-service connected. And this is where if you served or your spouse served for one day during active duty, 90 days total. So one day of active duty during a wartime period, I think I forgot to say that, during a wartime period and 90 days total, you are service eligible for non-service connected benefits. That means, and it's, it doesn't mean you have to go to war. You didn't have to step anywhere. You can have a sweep in a broom, you know, sweep in a floor in San Francisco. You still qualify eligibility wise. You still have to financially and medically qualify. You will need to need assistance with two activities of daily living, right? We talked about the bathing, dressing, feeding, toileting, transferring, and now medical uh, medicine maintenance. And then you also need to be financially uh, qualified. And I, the 2024 numbers, and I'm so sorry because they keep changing. You have to have net worth of less than, I think it's 154,000 and some change, which means your gross income for the year, plus your assets. Your home is exempt, so don't consider your home. So a lot of people don't qualify based on the net worth here in San Diego, um, but it doesn't mean that, so with the plan I told you about the husband and wife, we're doing the reverse mortgage, we're doing the in-home uh, in supportive services, we're doing the PACE program. And then in the event that they start running out of money, 
This is why the reverse mortgage is so great because the line of credit doesn't count as an asset doesn't count. So once they spend down their savings to such a point, then they're going to be able to add the veterans benefits on there, plus still have the equity in their home to use. So we can play and use all of these benefits together. That kind of in a nutshell is why the elder law attorney, what we do is we look at the bigger scope, say, what can we use to put where, and then how can we do it? There's also a death pension. So if you are receiving service-connected disability income and for more than eight years, if you're hundred percent rated, I'm just having, having a mental, I'm sorry, it's eight or 10 years and I can't remember now, but if you're hundred percent rated or you die from what it is based on the timing, then your surviving spouse will be entitled to uh, a death pension. And so that's great because she then receives DIC, dependent indemnity compensation, just for being married to you. And then when she needs, she or he needs care, then they will get the non-service connected pension addition. It's called the aid in attendance and it will be added to it. So it's a great option, but this is where people that are like 90% rated, 80%, they needed to jump up to 100% rated. So that's why I tell people, don't just give up. The VA, unfortunately, can be difficult. Um, a lot, I've learned from some of my colleagues that were actually one of them in particular worked at the VA office doing this pension work. And she indicated that there's a lot of people who are bitter and just don't want people to get benefits. And it just made me sad because they're not veterans, right? They didn't do this. They have no idea. And so they consider it free money and they were just kind of not very nice about it as opposed to what it really is is you earned it you're you put your life on the line so that i can have an amazing life that is that is money you earn and you should get it and that's why we do what we do and then there's also the va caregiver support program so not only is it going to provide the, the patient something the caregiver is going to get respite the caregiver is going to get support they're going to get their own social worker there's going to be services right there's um i know part of that program uh, we did a there was like a spa day which was it's silly i know it sounds but it's how important it is to give people a break and it's being a caregiver is exhausting and for those of you who are doing it my heart is with you you are not alone you need support you need to remember that you have to put your oxygen mask on first to save those around you, right? Every time you feel like you're losing it, just think of the flight attendant's golden rule and do something, whether it's going to the backyard to scream, whether it is, you know, I need a break, I need a girl's weekend, I need a, I need a, I need a, I need, I need something, I need to go down to the donut shop. I don't care what it is. Find it and do it. If it's, you know, I don't, it doesn't matter. Whatever is right for you, find it. Sorry, I'll grandstand on this all day long. I'm trying, sorry. Gotta keep moving. So the VA caregiver support program, again, you've got your adult day health care, you've got home-based primary care programs, so you've got physicians that can actually come to you, you've got homemaker and home health aid programs, you know, telehealth, you know, that was, you know, we got to say there are some positives that came out of COVID and telehealth is one of them because it's really given options to people. Respite. I said respite before, but if you don't know what respite is, you need it. It's just that simple. Respite is actually taking a break. It is, there are the VA, there's other programs that you can, you know, you can, your loved one can go to a memory care facility for the weekend. You can go on a, you can stay at home. <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere. You can staycation and just have the break. Um, I've had a lot of people who are caring for their loved one that has major neurocognitive disorders and they send their loved ones on a vacation. They, some of these facilities, they will act like it's a hotel. I have one client, I love it. Uh, I was court appointed for, her. just cracks me up. She believed that she was living in a hotel and it was a memory care facility and they gave her fake money because she tipped everybody all day long. She really thought she was in a hotel there. You know, they had casino nights periodically. So she's in Vegas or Macau or wherever she thought she was. And it was great. Like, like it was a great life for her and, and they gave it to her. And this, this client just felt like, or their, their, their daughter just felt like they were giving up and failing their parent, but they weren't, they actually gave her a quality of life that she wouldn't have had otherwise. So it's like, don't, 
be so caught up. Well, they never wanted to leave home. Well, yeah, but they also didn't ever want to have dementia. And they also didn't want to have Alzheimer's. And they have a disease that impacts their brain that maybe somebody's better at treating them than you are as their loved one. So don't be afraid to ask for help and get that respite because you really might see some benefit out of for everybody. They also have skilled home care. So you can actually have nursing come into your home and then home hospice care, right? You know, people do want to die at home and they should have that right if they can. And so having hospice come in and providing that, I do like to think hospice is more for the caregivers and family than it is for the patient because you do get so much out of it. So now we're going to talk about Medicare versus Medi-Cal. And so a lot of when we're talking about these benefits is like the definitions. If we get past the definitions, we can kind of, it'll help. But Medicare is just health insurance. And I feel like people think it's going to be this grand old, you know, it's going to care for me. Not really. It's just your health insurance. And it pay, it's paid out by your social security. I think what we're up to 174 something a month, 174.90. And so now it's coming out of your social security and it's just your health insurance. It is, um, you paid into it, you get it back. And so it, most people will have part A and part B. So your part A is your hospital and part B is your medical insurance, just like your Blue Cross Blue Shield, your Anthem, your whatever, that's your medical insurance. You can have a part C, you don't have to, and it's a private health insurance. It's like a supplement. You can have a part D, which is your drug coverage. And then you can have other supplements, part F, G, and N, which like Medigap plans or HMOs, things like that. But what, what's very important is that it does not cover long-term custodial care. I just went to someone's house a couple of weeks ago and the two adult sons are living in mom's home. Um, mom is aging and not doing well. Daughter came out to say, what are we gonna do? Um, mom's been a long time client. So I, you know, went home, went to her house on my way home and said, okay, ma'am, what's the plan? You know, your adult sons, I know you love them because we've been planning this for a long time, but you are going to need care and your only asset is the home. So we need to come up with a plan. And the, the adult son actually said to me, well, she has Medicare. We don't need your help, ma'am. And I said, well, yes, you do, because Medicare is not going to do anything. Medicare is going to get you into a doctor. Medicare is going to maybe get you up to 100 days in a skilled nursing facility if you can prove that you need it because it's for medical services. People get upset because Medicare won't cover long-term care in a facility, but it's only covering medical services. If I don't need rehab on my knee, I can't get a prescription for knee rehab, right? And so that is why they can't provide services because you have to need them. So that is where you run into the Medicaid side because Medicaid, which in California we call Medi-Cal because we're very special. Um, and it's totally different in California than it is everywhere else. But that is why we have Medicaid. Medicaid will provide custodial long-term care. And it's important when we're talking about Medi-Cal that people realize what it was originally created for was to end the pauperization of spouses, right? That's in the original legislation and it was to provide support for long-term care. And it is a needs-based program that is jointly funded by the state and federal Medicaid, right? So the federal government kind of oversees it, but the states get to run it within their guidelines. And it can be a health insurance, it, for your low-cost health coverage, that has been added to it. Um, it pays for medically necessary health care services. But what I focus and what elder law attorneys focus on is it's used for long-term care, which is kind of how it was created intentionally for, but it's just kind of been added all these other services onto. But it's important to really, 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 really understand that it's it's unique in California. So everything I'm gonna talk about does not apply anywhere else, okay? If you plan on moving, it will not apply. And if you live somewhere else, you're probably gonna to wanna to move here. It's kind of a joke. Um, and it provides all the protections, basically when people for the middle class, like that would be the like what it's gonna be more for. And it also focuses on spousal protections along the way. 
So if you are qualified for and eligible for SSI, you automatically get Medi-Cal. That's it. Be very easy. Um, and if you have an income level that makes you ineligible, you still can qualify under the medically needy if it's within their limits. I have a client who, oh gosh, it's horrible, but their cost of care is so astronomical because they have this really rare disease. They became, they fit under the medically needy program, even though they had a job and like high income and things, it just would never qualify for, like they're uninsurable. So they were able to qualify. But the, the key concepts I really kind of want to focus on is we're going to, Medi-Cal now is like a share of cost and a state recovery. Those are the most important things. And I have recent changes in here and I meant to take it out because the changes are from 2017. Time sure does fly, doesn't it? <laughs> it's not. Um, so Medi-Cal for long-term care. Um, how, what do we use? My, my favorite use, whew, I don't know. Gene, stop moving it. I'm just okay. In home care, in home supportive services, IHSS, that is going to be a very good arrow in our quiver because it's going to be allow people to get private home care. You can, it could be a child that gets paid, it could be a neighbor that gets paid, or it could be somebody from the county who comes in and gets paid. And they'll pay hourly for up to 283 hours, depending on the your your needs so a social worker evaluates you and they'll pay minimum wage in the county in which you're in there are community-based adult services um those are again things you can get through the pace program you can get other type of you know adult programs then your skilled nursing facility so it will cover those skilled nursing that could be up to fifteen thousand dollars and then there's the assisted living waiver program that would be if you qualify for Medi-Cal with no share of cost, you could have a board and care or assisted living or a memory care that's pretty much covered entirely by Medi-Cal. And it could be a very good option. Be mindful that the wait list is between seven and 11 months long because there's only 7,500 beds in all of California. Um, people who are in a skilled nursing facility have priority on that list. So when planning, if there is a catastrophic event that leads somebody into a hospital and you are discharged to a skilled nursing facility, that is when somebody goes to a hospital and it looks like they're going to need skilled nursing, that is the time you call an elder law attorney. There is, if you let them be your loved one be discharged, we can't go back and fix it. So it's very important that you kind of, that's why the pre-planning makes a lot of sense. But if you haven't planned, at least that is the crisis time. Because you want to be discharged to a skilled nursing facility that accepts Medi-Cal. And the reason why is because you're never going to get into one unless through a hospital transfer. It's just statewide. It's how it is. It's not fair, but it's the way it is. And when you're there, you know, you want it to be a Medi-Cal accepting facility, not because you're going to live there forever, but because it, you can get on the assisted living waiver program while you're there and you have priority over everybody who's living at home and on the assisted living waiver program. So you will jump ahead of people on the list. So that is a very good tool that we like to use because it gets you where you need to be, right? My goal is to keep people out of nursing homes. Nobody wants to live in a nursing home. And so if we can, we're going to. So I know that somebody has asked the, you know, Medi-Cal eligibility changes in the law. What I'm going to talk about is kind of groundbreaking. Um, I am doing the circuit right now because nobody seems to be talking about it. And I'm trying to teach as many people as I possibly can about this. January 1st of this year, California extinguished the asset limitations. So if people think about Medi-Cal, you've always known you can't have more than $2,000 in the bank. And that's like it, right? That's what they think about. But the reality is... You can um, now, sorry, I got a question. <laughs> the, it, what it is is, and oh, and then um, last, last year, it turned by $230,000. So we had these two different, you know, couldn't have more than $2,000 in the bank. Then you couldn't have $130,000 in the bank. Now you 
can have unlimited assets. And when I say unlimited assets, I mean, you could have a billion dollars in the bank, but as long as there's no income being produced from that billion dollars, you qualify for Medi-Cal. And I give that extreme example because it's at that extreme. Um, there's no limit. You can have six houses. You can have, you know, 52 Lamborghinis. You know, you can have, you just can't have income. And it's really hard to like fathom that this is what the standard of the law is right now. But that is what it is. <laughs> um, and so what we're going to look at now is because assets have been eliminated, everything is income, right? It's the only thing that matters. And for people who want to look at it, if you want to geek it out, it's Assembly Bill 133. And we're now phase two, right? I said it went from 2,000 to 130,000 to unlimited. It's kind of hard to understand because we're still only a month and 21 days into it. And so it's we're still trying to figure out how it's going to work. Um, but all we care now about is income, right? And the income limits um, are about $1,800 for an individual. So if you're kind of below that, then you're qualified. Now, Medi-Cal considers your net income. And so what is the income? It is your gross, so whatever your taxable income is. So if your Social Security is um, $1,900 a month, but you pay $174 for your Medicare, and then you're also paying $132 um, in a supplemental insurance, right? It has to be insurance. Then that math problem is how much your income. So you're down to $1,628. You're qualified for Medi-Cal. Um, so... A lot of times when you're looking at Medi-Cal, we're going to start looking at income. We're going to start looking at how we transfer your income around. And that's what people are going to be looking at. And when I spoke to the financial planning council, that's what it was. It was, you know, people are really going to start focusing on how do I minimize my income or how do I create pro systems where my I can turn on and off income sources. And that's really what people are going to be doing. And so because it's going to be so much easier to qualify for Medi-Cal, we need to be mindful that the demand for Medi-Cal is going to go up, but the supply has not changed. So access to these services may become less. And so we're still, again, we're not even two months into this. We don't, we as practitioners are still trying to figure it out and navigate it, but that's where I think the home and community-based services are going to skyrocket because that is how we're going to use this. We're going to keep people out of facilities because people are going to be able to access support in home, right? And, and I really get excited when I think about it because I start to get doom and gloom, and I don't know if anybody else is, about the lack of places. But then I start to think of the abilities we're going to be able to use it to keep people in their home, and I start to get very excited. And so... I really want to focus kind of on the spouse side of it because that's where this really works really well because, you know, the individual, it, it's, it is a low income base. It's 138% of the federal poverty level. It's a pretty low amount. But if you're married, the spousal protections, the minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance, the MIMNA is a very important number. So if as a couple, you have less than $3,854, you'll qualify for Medi-Cal services. It's not that simple because it's a shifting of an income. And, but basically, I kind of tell people, if you look at that number and you as a couple are below that in your net amount, when I say net amount, remember, your gross amount minus your Medicare, minus your you know health insurance premiums, you may need to buy extra insurance. You might need to get a dental plan or a vision plan to get you below it. You get below it, all of a sudden you can qualify. And so what does it mean though, right? Like, how do we do it? If I'm married, right? There's a lot of things that we as planners are looking at. There's the name on the check rule. The name on the check rule means that the community spouse, the well spouse, gets to keep all the income received in their name, regardless of the amount. So if you have a rental property and that income is kicking you over it, 
take the sick spouse name off the deed. Well, then maybe you don't want to do that because of taxes, right? So don't do any of this without the plan. We need a long-term care plan. We need your CPA involved. But there's a lot of potential. Like who is the check being made out to? Can we have the dividends paid to one spouse and not the other? There's a lot of ideas. There's also um, 3,100 petitions. And that that is a probate code in California that us attorneys can use to ask the court to raise the MIMNA. So if your income is $4,800, you don't qualify, but we can file a petition asking a judge to increase that amount. And we haven't started doing those because it's new, but I'm going to start doing them and we're going to see how it works. And I think educating the judiciary or judges about how this works and how it's allowable and how California wrote these rules to help spouses. Because you got to remember these rules for like the MIMNA, the, med, the the minimum amount of money, that is still a nationwide value. So San Diego, we're a little bit different. We are a little higher cost of living. And then there's also qualified domestic relations order for support. This is something if you've been through a divorce, you may know. You don't have to get divorced. Do not get divorced before you see a lawyer because you can have income shifted through a court order without a divorce. So these are some of just the ideas of what we've been doing as planners to kind of come up with ideas because we are a bunch of geeks and we do like to sit around and talk about this all day. Um, there are transfer rules. So I don't want anybody doing any of this on their own. And when I say transfer rules, in theory, there are no more transfer rules. There is an all countywide director's letter that says they will not, Medi-Cal will not ask you about transfers anymore because there's no asset limit. But that letter to me has a has an ambiguity in it and I'm really nervous about it. So I, I can't say that there are questions still pending. So we're not going to do anything proactively that could hurt somebody. So we still have a look back period of 30 months if there's a gift, whether there's anything wrong with it, I'm not sure. <laughs> and But all the same rules apply. So we can still make plans and still implement plans to get people qualified that may be on the cusp. Um, we also, you know, exempt assets are not penalized. So your home, you can always do things with, but be very careful with what you're doing because there's negative consequences for taxes and other things. So we don't do anything in a vacuum. We need your whole team. But because Medi-Cal is now so accessible to so many people, I mean, I did when I was learning about this, I did raise my hand and I'm like, how are we going to pay for this? Right? Because to me, I think there's a lot of concern. And the answer was estate recovery. So the state's plan to recover, to pay for this is to take it back from people when they die. And this is why I said at the beginning, everybody needs a trust. Everybody. And this doesn't have to be an elder law attorney or anything. This is just state planning. Everybody needs a trust because under the law, Medi-Cal can only recover from a probate estate. What did I say a trust was? It was a probate avoidance device, right? It defines who can sign your name when you can't. What is probate? A process by which a judge decides who can sign your name. So anything that's in your trust, right? Assets are irrelevant. So if you've got bank accounts, real estate, stocks, bonds, whatever is in there can't be recovered. So it's important to think, I need this trust now. It, I used to say we could do things with transfer on death, pay other law on death. Yes, you can, but financial institutions screw that up all the time. Excuse my language. They just do. They make, a mis they make mistakes more than they don't. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but they make a lot of mistakes in my business. I see it a lot. So I just want a trust to be mindful. I want everybody to be mindful on those. But if you have a surviving spouse, Medi-Cal can't recover from you. So that's important. Just make sure you know who's going to die first. And then um, what's really important is if there is an estate recovery, you are entitled to a breakdown, a very detailed breakdown. And I am going to tell you that my largest appeal for the, my success, my life, it was about $400,000. Medi-Cal tried to collect this after somebody's passing. And I said, give me a copy of the medical expenses. And they were double dipping. They were charging for in-home supportive services, as well as school skilled nursing. 
And so I, I obviously questioned it. And I said, so for eight years, somebody was receiving both in-home supportive services and skilled nursing. Can you explain how that happened? Well, the, the Medi-Cal recipient had been in the hospital and been in the facility for two weeks. They forgot to recode it. So the claim was knocked down about 400,000. So always look, because it's a government bureaucracy. Um, what they can't recover from, right? Nothing to probate. So anything in your revocable living trust, anything you have in joint tenancy, payable on death, transfer on death, life insurance, retirement accounts. Here's the problem with those. In order for that all to work, you have to know the order by which everybody's going to die. And so that's why your revocable living trust is the only guarantee because you have, if someone dies, then this, then this, then this, then this. But if you have a joint tenant or a payable on death, you have to be sure you know who's going to die first. And my crystal ball is not clear on who's going to die first. I mean, best laid plans. My parents swore up and down. You know, my mother had cancer twice. My dad's parents lived forever. The plan was my dad was going to die second. My mother was going to die young. They, they planned that out and there was no survivor's benefit. Well, my dad had a massive heart attack and died. Left my mother with $800 a month in income. And it was horrible. So best laid plans don't guarantee, you know, you can't guarantee who's going to die first. So I, I know that was a lot and I know we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to try, hopefully Jean's been keeping up on them so that we can get through <laughs> some of these. I, I have been. So let's see. I want to go back a little bit and just touch on veterans benefits a little bit. Um, so I think, <clears throat> I think it was pretty clear from what you presented that a veteran can still qualify for benefits, even if, you know, they have assets of their own. Correct. That so each program is kind of dependent on, has its own qualifications, depending on service days. Was it a war? Uh, when Correct. was the injury, whatever it might be. Correct. Because you've got service related that is completely irrelevant to assets and income. That's not even considered because it's service, you know, service related injuries. But for non-service related injuries, indigent doesn't mean, you know, you don't have to have nothing. You can have a home, right? You, that's a, that's San Diego. That's a lot. You can have, you know, a million dollar home. You know, there's no limit. You There's a limit on acreage size, but not on the home's value. You can have 100, I think it's about 154,000, and I'm making that number up off the top of my head, in net worth. So if you have, you know, $80,000 in ass, in income, then you can have up to that in, you know, up to the maximum for the, your net worth in the bank. So that's why, you know, a lot of times people think that you can have nothing, but you, you can have quite a bit and still qualify. So, and then this one related to just says, um, this person says that their husband, who is a veteran, spent eight years in in uh, Vietnam, in service in Vietnam, but they were denied benefits because of income. I don't Thoughts? know what income. Well, OK, so they don't give you benefits. If it's for long term care, you it's a reimbursement program, meaning that if you they will pay you, they will reimburse for cost of care if you exceed your income in paying for care. So let's say you have $2,500 in income and you have to spend $2,600 for care, then they will reimburse you to whatever amount you're eligible for like $2,300, let's say if you're married, that kind of thing. So it's just not free money. It is reimbursement for care that you've paid for. And they will do it on a monthly basis because you have a care contract. And so it's a monthly, but it is a reimbursement, not a just free money. Right. Okay. Uh, switching gears a little bit. This is a family member qualified for <clears throat> Social Security disability income, but has not received that increase yet six months ago. The Social Security office says they're backlogged. What are, what's some guidance for this person asking the question? So the only guidance I have, so I'm not a social security expert. I would say call Elise Kelman. <laughs> she is my referral. Uh, if you call our office, that's who we would refer to. Let me see if I can actually just get her name because she is who we refer to for social security benefit issues. 
Um, and I can't find it off the top of my head. Um, sorry, but if there is, um, so I always make the, you know, social security is that you need to focus on that only generally because there's so many things. Um, but her number is, I mean, if we want to give it out, it's 858-576-0401. Her name's Elise Kelman. She does social security benefit stuff work. Elise Kelman, okay. She's my Could you just number. repeat that number for us one more time? It's 858-576-0401. Social security benefits, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see here. A couple of kind of medical type questions. Uh, are there qualified specialized medical attorneys to help with applications no. for medical for pace for that kind of thing not attorneys so there are so like when it comes to pace like if you go into the gary and mary west pace center or if you go down i think i think it's in um st paul's um if you go if you just google it like you can go in there and they'll help you for free do the application yeah. so um, if you need help qualifying, then you will need to see an elder law attorney. If you need to kind of get your assets and, you know, figure out the income situation, then an attorney would be necessary. But there's no attorneys that just do applications. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's see here. Mom is living with Lewy body dementia. 12 years ago, I was added to the title as a joint tenant, the house title. We only have a power, a durable power of attorney. Didn't do a trust. She has Medi-Cal and IHSS. If or when she passes, we would go to probate. Or is there something we can be we can do now to avoid that? So I really don't like this plan that you did, but it's too late to do it. But the only reason is it's a very good plan for purposes of avoiding probate because as long as you don't die first. Um, if mom passes away, as matter as an operation of law, the home belongs to you. And it will not most likely not be reassessed for purposes of property tax because of the death of a joint tenant, but I need to know more details. Um, the negative you have is that it's not going to get a full step up in basis for purposes of capital gains. And so that is a negative tax consequence that 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 planning does. So we don't recommend doing that. Um, but it's too late to fix it because of the Prop 19, unless you are both living in the home, but you can't transfer properties back and forth without increasing property taxes now because of Prop 19. So be careful when voting people. Just remember that. <laughs> and there's a couple of other questions. They're very, very quite specific. I would suggest that um, the people asking those questions could start by calling Alzheimer's San Diego to see if we may be able to give you the answers or the information you seek. And certainly if it looks like you are in need of some legal advice, you can call Ms. McGee's office and and set up an appointment to to meet with her. So I think we'll keep going because we're yeah. getting a wee bit low on time. Because I talked to you, sorry, home stretch. It, yeah, the, the changes to medical were are, are pretty big. So I do apologize for the. I'm going to do my best. Um, so our next steps, right, and additional resources. So what you need to do. Next steps, gather all your documents, get your income, get your property, get your investment. Please keep your legal documents in one location. I can't tell you how hard it is to like over here and over here and some are in the safe deposit box and some are in the filing cabinet. Um, don't, please don't ever take things out of your binder. If you have an estate planning binder, please keep it all in there because I can't tell you how many binders I open here and we're missing pages. Like don't, don't do that. Take, do the whole thing, take it with you. Um, it's better to lose the whole thing than a two pages. I'm sure it's not better to lose it, but it's harder to lose it that way. Please tell people where they are. Please create a plan if you don't have it. Please update your plan. Look at it. It's a living, breathing 
document. It is supposed to change with you. Um, and then please talk to people, tell them your wishes. The examples I have with my parents is they both have very, very specific plans. Very. My mom was, if I get a hangnail, push me off the roof of the hospital. My dad was cut off my head and freeze it. I know they will find a cure for what ails me. Like they were solid. And then right before they died, two months before my dad died, he was like, I know you joke about that, but I don't want to be an invalid. I don't. And he changed his mind. And then my mom, 35 days before she died, she changed her mind. These are changes that are real. So if she didn't tell me, I wouldn't know. And my brothers and I got in a fight about it at the hospital, but I knew what she wanted. She told me. So please share and talk about it. Maybe it's not Easter dinner conversation, but, you know, talk about it. Um, and find out who will keep things on file. Some places will, I said, but not, not very many. Um, if you're moving outside of California or you're, you know, looking to, you know, or if you are outside of California, remember that these laws are very specific to specific states. I'm licensed in Nevada and California. What I just told you here in California is not applicable in Nevada. It's just not. So we are licensed in individual states. The laws are different. Medicaid is totally different in California than it is anywhere else. Like Massachusetts has MedMass, just like we have Med Medi-Cal. Like they're different per state as well. And so you need to be mindful. We wanted to do some planning for somebody. And then they were like, well, mom's going to move to Virginia. Well, then we can't do the planning because Virginia, I need a Virginia lawyer to plan them. So you got to be mindful of that. Um, we have so many resources through Alzheimer's. You know, it is so important that California, we've got the advanced healthcare directives online, right? We have Pulse form online. Oh, the Consumer's Toolkit for Healthcare Advanced Planning, really good. Compassion and Choices, the compassionandchoices.org. I've, I've sent people because you... It gives you ideas. It has you think of things that you didn't know you didn't know. Um, when looking for an elder law attorney, and they said not all of us are certified, you can go to NALA. NALA.org, it's National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. I was the president of Southern California chapter. That's why I'm saying there are so many highly qualified that are not certified because the National Elder Law Foundation is who certifies you. So NALA is a great place to find one. NELF is where you want if you go for a certified. Um, the State Bar of California is you're going to find other estate planning attorneys. We don't have a separate elder law bar. San Diego County Bar Association, we do have an elder law section, but that's mostly litigators who do financial elder abuse. Um, CANR, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. If you want all the information I just gave today in one place, <laughs> that is where to go. It will have frequently asked questions. It will give you math problems that you can recreate to create your own systems. That is the only place in California that has updated California only information. Um, there is the Department of Social Services, right? Um, community, there's the licensing. Before you move someone in somewhere, you can pull up their license. Let's see how many code violations they have. Be mindful, code violations. There's A, B, C, different types of violations. There is a difference between a health safety violation and somebody's, you know, vaccine record was put in the wrong file. Like there's, you know, procedural violations that are very simple mistakes, like uh, clerical errors versus actual care errors. So be mindful when you're looking at that, because I don't want, I've had people misunder, misinterpret that, like, this is a bad place. I'm like, no, they had a misfile <laughs> and it's a piece of paper. I do that in my office. I can't, you know, blame anybody. So you can always look at these, you know, websites to kind of look at what you're looking at. Medicare.org. My favorite place for Medicare advocacy and questions is the Center for Medicare Advocacy. I didn't know how to do things. I went to medicareadvocacy.org and I learned how, and now I teach lawyers how to do it, but they helped me. I called them and said, how do I do this? And they taught me and now I teach people. So they will help you for free and they're phenomenal. Um, you've got social security, the compassionate allowances. You also have the Medi-Cal and then there's the VA caregiver support programs on there as well. And this is me. <laughs> <laughs> which I forgot it's in here. Um, 
just remember that Alzheimer's San Diego, there's a reason I give my time. I love this organization. This, the per, information, the education, the support, the, the screenings, the everything, the social, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia and major neurocognitive disorders is so isolating. And I know it is. I've lived it. I felt it. It is hard. Please utilize these resources because we're here for, I say we am not part of the organization, but I feel like I am. We are, it's here and use us, use it and do not sit isolated. You know, go to the website, call them. And I mean, I'm not kidding. Like some of these questions that are unanswered, Jean's going to be able to answer or somebody in the office will. Yeah, yeah. And please do the online survey. Um, we want to know. I want to know what you want to know. Jean needs to know what you need, right? Because this is an organization that's for you. It is not for anybody else. And so if you don't kind of give us the feedback, we don't know what we can do better. We don't know how to help you more. And that's what we want to do. So, Absolutely. and one of the questions was, are the program materials going to be available? Yes, they will. Yes, they are. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to get those, um, this, like the presentation, the slide deck out to all of you, you know, as soon as we wrap up here. So don't feel like, oh my gosh, I didn't get the names of all those websites written down. You're going to get this information this afternoon yet. And um, I do want to say, yes, this has been recorded and we will be posting it on our webinar library so that, you know, you can come back to it at any time. And we also just want to say truly um, such a huge big thank you to Ms. McGee for, again, just, you know, her gift of time and her expertise in these areas. What would we do otherwise? I don't know. I mean, these changes are all very recent and they're new to all of us at Alzheimer's San Diego. And, you know, with regards to Medi-Cal, I'm referring specifically to. Um, so we're very, very grateful for, you know, your sharing this time and, and knowledge with us and with our families. So and, thank and you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. But I do want to say, and I'm, it's my pleasure. And because we are in such a, we don't know stage, I will be updating Alzheimer's San Diego with things that we learn, like the big things as, as they happen. So that, you know, that's why please keep reaching out to Alzheimer's, keep using mm -hmm. their services because things are changing. Services are changing. Access to services are changing and your cost of services are changing. So there's a lot happening and, and we want you to have access to it. Yeah, absolutely. So folks, we got through a lot of information here today with just a wee bit over the timeline. So that's pretty good, I think. Um, and so we will say, you know, good afternoon to everybody and thank you for joining us. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us and also know that you have Ms. McGee that you can contact at her practice as well too. So that's it for today, folks.